Stand by. When you first start getting interested in self-defense handguns, you soon realize that there are a lot of guns to choose from. Most modern handguns from the major manufacturers are extremely reliable and built to last a lifetime. If you're looking to acquire your first gun or another gun, you should visit your local gun shop so that you can handle the various firearms. Everybody's hand is unique and each gun has its attributes, so finding one that fits your hand is very important. This program is produced to help you develop an understanding of the most popular self-defense guns and ammunition in the world. Hello, I'm Lenny McGill. This is part two of a series titled Basic Self-Defense Handgun Use and Safety. In part one, we discussed the shooting fundamentals including stance, grip, sight alignment and sight picture, and trigger pull. In part two, we'll introduce you to eight different self-defense handguns and six different types of self-defense ammunition. Plus, the importance of precision shooting at close self-defense distances and basic self-defense shooting drills to help you increase your skill level. The information you're about to see is being presented by two of the most skilled and respected names in the self-defense shooting industry, Ken Hackathorn and Bill Wilson. Hackathorn is one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject of the tactical deployment of small arms. He has trained U.S. military special forces, FBI and police, and anti-terrorist units. He's been involved in the tactical application of firearms for more than 25 years. Bill Wilson is the president and founder of Wilson Combat, manufacturers of high-quality custom gun parts, accessories, and complete custom guns for self-defense and competition. While his background started as a competition shooter in 1974, Wilson has devoted the past six years to the development and application of self-defense handguns. Now let's get started with part two of basic self-defense handgun use and safety. Here's Ken Hackathorn and Bill Wilson. Okay, what we have in front of us here is a uh, fairly wide selection of uh, high quality defensive type uh, handguns. Um, Ken and I both agree that the 1911 style gun with the modifications that, uh, that we both like, like this uh, new Wilson 1996 AT pistol, is our choice of a defensive pistol. You know, this is, if we have our dreathers and uh, uh, we get in a, in a serious confrontation. This is the gun we hope we have with us. However, a lot of people don't want to go to the, the expense of a quality 1911 or uh, the extra training sometimes that it, that it requires to uh, get the maximum efficiency out of a 1911-style pistol. So we want to discuss uh, a wide variety of, of quality uh, guns here and also what each, you know, Ken and I will each discuss what we like and dislike about each gun. Uh, any one of these guns on the table 
serves a, a defensive use purpose and also uh, will serve you very well when the chips are down. First, we've got the uh, SIG 226. Very high quality gun, has a very good reputation for accuracy and, and reliable, reliability. Uh, the main thing I like about this pistol is typically out of the box, they have exceptionally good single action you know, trigger pulls on them, and the gun is extremely accurate. The thing I don't like about the gun is the double action trigger reach is so long that for the size of hands I have, I have an extremely tough time shooting the first shot double action. I have to almost throw the first shot away. And the fact that the grip holds my hand extremely low in relation to the bore line, so I get a lot more muzzle flip than I do with a lot of the other 9mm handguns. So that's what I like and dislike about the SIG 226. Uh, I'm much like Bill. It's a good pistol. As you well know, it's a probably one of the most common handguns adopted by federal law enforcement. It's got a great reputation of reliability, quality manufacturing, they, sh they shoot well. Uh, the double action transition on this gun is a little difficult, and Bill's right, because while they have excellent single action, nice crisp, almost three and a half pound single action pulls, they tend to have rather hard, long double action presses. So most people I find don't shoot the DA shots well. The guns are, uh, are very popular. They're very pricey. I mean, retail price for this gun now is close to a thousand dollars. They have a more compact version, by the way, called the Sig 228, which is a little shorter in the slide, shorter in the butt, and it's currently the most popular gun being used by the federal law enforcement. Matter it's a standard like gun for the FBI, and I like the 228. It's a good little gun. If I were going to pick one to carry concealed, so the big 226 service pistol, I'd probably select the 228. They've actually got a new version of it in 40 called the 229. But you can't go along with it, wrong with a SIG. Remember, one of the things about it, it decocking mechanism is a lever on the side of the frame. So to decock this pistol, you flip the lever down and it's decocked. The downside, of course, is there's no manual safety. Anybody can pick up this gun, pull the trigger, and fire it. So as long as you understand that, uh, you'll be okay. The manual arms, even as a left-hander, the decocker is designed to be worked by a right-hander. But if you are left-handed, you simply take your trigger finger up, decock the pistol. But it's a quality handgun and one that would be highly recommended. Okay, the next, next pistol we're going to discuss is the Breda 92F. Uh, as you probably know, this is a current military issue sidearm. And uh, the military spent a lot of time testing every, everything that was available on the market before they selected this pistol as a, the service sidearm. I have to admit, when, when the military first uh, adopted this pistol, I was pretty skeptical and I, I didn't have much faith in this gun. But since that time, I, I've had uh, a lot of rounds down range with this gun. I've, I've shot, shot these pistols uh, for several years now, and just on its own merits. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't go into this deal saying, oh, well, I like that gun, and then hoping it was good. I basically went into shooting a Beretta saying, I don't like that gun. Prove to me that you're good. And after, after uh, probably maybe 50,000 rounds I've shot through the Brad 92F now, it's proven to me that it is probably the single most reliable production pistol on the market today. I mean, of anything I've ever tried, I think it's the most reliable. It has another uh, big advantage to it. The double action, single action transition is the most controllable of any double action as far as I'm concerned. When you fire the gun double action, the hammer falls at that point. You cock it and shoot it single action, which will be your second shot. The trigger breaks from exactly the same point. So you fire the first shot double action, then it's cocked for the second shot. You have the same trigger location, just a slightly lighter trigger pull. So that makes a very quick transition to shoot like a double tap to go, you know, first shot, second shot. Uh, typically, the Breda 92F is extremely accurate also. Um, 
I've had uh, had some of these that, are, that will shoot like an inch and a half at 25 yards right out of the box with quality hollow point ammunition. The downside to the Beretta 92F is its sheer size. It's, it's, it's long, it's tall, and it's extremely thick. So concealability for like a concealed carry gun, basically it takes a fairly large physique to be able to carry this gun comfortably and fully concealed. So while it's a terrific service sidearm where concealment is not your, your primary concern, um, it might not be your best choice for a, for a concealed carry gun just because of its sheer size, even though it has all the other advantages that you would want in a, in a quality service pistol. And I'm much like Bill. When this gun came along, I saw it as a, the gun that was going to replace the great 1911. And it's kind of a, almost a, 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 an unacceptable thing. Because I do training and, and have done some instruction for the U.S. military, I figured I better get one and learn how to shoot the gun they're using. And I'm just like Bill. I've come to really like the pistol. As a matter of fact, I didn't expect it. I had set it out thinking, well, this gun doesn't have any, any virtues that I can possibly appreciate. I'll be honest with you. It, I use them a lot. I keep one in my bag. If I'm going to pick up a 9, I have no problem picking one up. I can shoot it real well. I have a great deal of confidence in the gun. It, and Bill's right. It's the most accurate or excuse me, the most reliable production pistol I've ever used. It's incredible how well they work. Also, because it uses the dropping locking block of the Walther P38, it's also the softest shooting 9mm pistol you can possibly buy. But Bill's right, it's big and it's bulky. Um, and a lot of people, if you have small hands, will have a difficult time manipulating a pistol. But believe me, it's a good handgun. And one of the drawbacks, of course, because of its size, it, it was designed as a service pistol, a duty gun. If you're going to carry it concealed, you're probably going to have to find yourself really working hard to make this gun uh, disappear. May it literally force you into an inside the pants holster, and because of its bulk, you're going to have a bulge. Okay, the next pistol we're going to talk about is the uh, famous or infamous Glock. You know, the early years when they first came out, there was all this, you know, hoopla about it being invisible to X-ray and all this kind of nonsense. Well, you know, when in fact there's a, a lot more steel in this gun than there is a, a lot of complete guns. The Glock has developed a very good reputation within the police uh, uh, industry, and let's face it, the thing works. I mean, it, it, it to me, is the ugliest handgun on the table here. If, I mean, if you rate the guns on cosmetics, it would have to be my least favorite gun of sports cosmetics. But the gun has some very, very good points to it. Uh, one, it's simplicity of operation. Nothing is simpler than you pick up the gun and you pull the trigger. There's nothing else to do. I mean, there's no safeties, no decocking levers, nothing else to worry about. You just, you know, the gun is either fired or it's not. I mean, you just pick it up and, and fire the gun. Gun has a good reputation for reliability, uh, reasonable accuracy. I've, I've not been too impressed with accuracy on them. But uh, the other thing is the way the grip is designed, your hand sits very high with a gun. So like the Beretta, the bore line is real close to the top of your hand, which really aids you in controlling muzzle flip and gets you back on target for the second shot. So as far as I'm concerned, the big advantages of the Glock is the simplicity. There's no safeties to, cont to contend with. And the fact that it's very controllable under recoil because of where your hand position is and the reliability of the gun. The, the main drawbacks of it, the trigger pulls are not, it's not a crisp trigger pull, it's, it's like a, a cross between a single action and a double action trigger pull. Typically you get, a, you get a long, reasonably heavy trigger pull, which takes a lot of training to be able to shoot well. I mean, an experienced shooter can shoot a Glock very well. An inexperienced shooter will have more trouble firing accurate shots with a Glock than they will with a lot of the other service pistols we have on the table here. Uh, the other thing I don't like about it, and I have no idea why a Glock does it, but they, have, uh, they do extremely tight chamber dimensions on the barrel. If you shoot premium quality factory produced ammunition, you'll probably never have a functioning problem with your Glock. If you want to shoot hand loads to practice, you're going to have a lot of grief with a Glock. Um, and much like Bill, I find that people have one or two emotions about the Glock. Either they love it or they hate it. 
very little gray area. And again, I, I always rate the Glock as being a tool. There's nothing much aesthetic about owning one. They're, they're not pretty. They don't uh, actually provide a lot of pride of ownership, but they're very effective. And I see its main virtues is besides the simplicity in the manual of arms, they are guns that are very forgiving, not, not being cleaned and not being well lubricated. Most auto-loading auto pistols have one thing in common. They must be kept properly lubricated. The Glocks are incredibly forgiving. I've seen these things dry and dirty, and you would say any other gun probably wouldn't function a lot when the Glocks do. So if you're a person who doesn't like guns and doesn't want to main, don't care to maintain guns, um, a gun you don't care about banging into things, you don't care about whether it gets wet or your sweat on it, all those things, it's basically a gun kind of what we call for the masses. It's not a gun for the classes. Um, and it's one of the reasons it's a good police service pistol, because most police officers are not gun enthusiasts. They consider the, the handgun like their handcuffs or their nightstick. It's a tool. It's something they don't particularly want to maintain. It's something that when they pull it out, they want it to work. And in that sense, the Glock has a lot of virtues to it. Um, if you want one or you like one, try it out. M many people will probably find a Glock makes a great deal of sense for them for their use. Since we now have the 10-round magazine capacity in the country, remember this, this is a Glock 17 originally with a 17-shot magazine. To buy one of these now as a concealed firearm that only holds 10 rounds seems to me to be a little ludicrous because it's so big. Glocks recently introduced their little mini Glock pistol, in this case the Model 26, which is simply this pistol cut down. And this gun, you can see, is much smaller, shorter here and shorter there. And this gun now has the politically correct 10-round magazine. So given a choice to carry concealed, I would much prefer to buy the Glock 26, the minigun, in a smaller package that I could carry if I needed in a fanny pack or in a concealment holster. It's going to be easier to carry. I'm still going to have 10 rounds. The only concern I can tell you about this pistol is for a lot of people with big hands, there's not much to hold on to. Uh, there's an outfit called Pierce Grips that sells a replacement magazine floor plate. It's got a little finger groove on the bottom, a lot like Walther PBK or Breta, which helps. Or uh, some people will take the plus two magazine base plate and put on the gun, and that gives them more uh, place for their position for their finger. But overall, I think the little mini Glock at, for a 10-round pistol makes a great deal of sense for somebody that wants to have a concealment firearm. Okay, the next pistol is uh, John Brunning's last design in a, in a service-type pistol, the uh, Browning High Power or the P35, depending on what you want to call it. Uh, this is the current production Browning High Power, which has the uh, the new addition of the ambidextrous safety and the high visibility sights and a, a feed ramp now that feeds hollow points very well. As a 1911 fan, I just have to admit I really like high powers. I mean, I, I you know I've always liked the Browning high power. Uh, the Browning high power has uh, an enviable reputation for reliability. Uh, they're typically not extremely accurate, and they're typically the the trigger pulls are pretty crappy on your average Browning high power. That's kind of the downside to them. But on the plus side, it's one of the most controllable nine millimeters on the market as far as rapid fire, place your second, third, your fourth shot. Uh, your hand's real high in relation to the bore, and since the gun is all steel, it has, has a little bit of extra weight, and it has very little muzzle flip, and so it makes it very controllable. Uh, it's one of the flattest of the uh, uh, Wonder 9s of the 9mm double stack type guns, so it's, it's one of the most concealable of these service 9mm pistols. Uh, and you carry it cocked and locked just like you do your, your standard 1911 style gun. So I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan also of the high power. I, I like the high power real well, and you can't go wrong with a Browning high power. Yeah, I, I can't uh, agree more. Uh, to me, if you have to own one 9mm pistol, this is probably the one I would pick. Again, if you're not comfortable with a cocked and locked carry mode, then you may want to look at one of these other weapons. But if you can live with cocked and locked, and I certainly have no problem with it, this is the pistol. And these new generation Mark III's, like this one, they have the Ambi extended safety, most of them a black polymer finish. Um, I, superb guns. I, I, you know, one of the most combat-tested sidearms in the world. 13-round magazine. Of course, now the new ones are going to come with a 10-round box magazine. The 
pistol has recently been marketed and offered in 40 Smith & Wesson. And of course, it, I think it comes with a 10-round magazine. It's a, certainly a viable option. As Bill said, it's a superb gun to carry concealed because it's got that tapered, flat contour. It makes an easy gun to reholster. As you know, uh, a, a lot of places around the world, if you've got a service pistol, this is what's going to be. And if I had to carry a concealed 9mm and a full-size service pistol, uh, it would be a good gun. I agree with Bill, I, I, and I have to admit, I, first Browning High Power I bought when I was in an Army, I was about 21 years of age. I still have it, and I probably end up, I, now I probably have a half dozen of them. So, uh, yes, I like high powers, and they're one of my favorite 9mm pistols. A good choice if you like a single-action pistol. Yeah, the next one we got is the Smith & Wesson 3913, which is a, kind of a mid-sized gun. Uh, it's an extremely good, good pistol to carry, like in a fan pack carry, something like that, or inside the waistband. It, it's flat enough and small enough that it carries real comfortable in the inside the waistband type holster. The gun has developed a, a very good reputation for reliability. This particular gun here, I've shot maybe a thousand rounds of the gun. I, you know, it's, it's never malfunctioned. Uh, it's more than combat accurate. And uh, oftentimes, this is the gun that's in a, a fanny pack when I have to use a fanny pack carry. So uh, obviously, I, I like the gun. I have faith in it. I wouldn't, wouldn't carry it for that purpose. Uh, downside on, on the gun, um, I don't like any of uh, Smith & Wesson's double actions. I'll just be, you know, candid with you. Smith & Wesson has, the, I think, the worst double action setup of anybody. You got the, pull, the, the double action pull that lets off in one area, and then the single action pull after that lets off much farther to the rear, and typically your finger's all the way against the frame when, you, when you're pulling the trigger. You're having to push against the frame to get the gun to go off. I think the all the trigger let off should be farther forward than it is on the Smith & Wesson. So that's, that's basically what I don't, I don't like about the gun. Uh, the reliability and the size and everything is a big plus for it, and I guess the, the assets outweigh the, the trigger problem. Yeah, I uh, also own one of these things, and Bill and I can both remember a couple decades ago when the trend was to take Smith & Wesson 39s and cut them down. We had things like the Asp and the Scorpion and the DeVell yeah. conversion. And, and Smith & Wesson simply saw the popularity and they took their full-size M39 service pistol and basically cut it off and made it more compact and brought it out in a, in a stainless steel is a 3913 and in blue steel is a 3914. And I think this is one of the best pistols Smith & Wesson makes. It's very flat. It's very small. It's an easy gun to carry concealed. Because of the small grip, if you want to arm somebody that has small hands or many women will find for a full service size caliber cartridge, a 9mm, this is an easy gun for them to hold and manipulate and use. It's very reliable. Mine is very accurate. I was really surprised when I got the gun. It shoots superbly. Uh, I'm like Bill. I have a big hand and one of my problems is when I pull the trigger, my finger actually contacts the frame before the sears release and I'm actually pulling against the frame instead of the trigger. But that's because I've got a big hand and this is a little gun. Uh, overall, I rate this gun very high and typically when I recommend people buy a concealable, very small, compact handgun. This is one of the three handguns I recommend for the average person, is the Smith & Wesson 3913. Now we're into uh, basically pocket guns or uh, fanny pack guns or, or a gun to carry, uh, like an ankle holster or something like that. Uh, the little Smith & Wesson, what is it called, airweight, is that what they're called? Air, airweight Centennial with a, a covered hammer. Uh, this is an extremely popular and good handgun to carry for deep concealment inside, you know, inside the waistband use, fanny pack use, in a pocket holster, that sort of thing.
as far as I'm concerned, the only drawback to these guns is, uh, you know, that it takes a pretty good skill level to, to hit very well with them at any reasonable distance. But let's face it, most of the gunfights happen at three to five, seven yards, something like that. And three to five yards, you know, the, the gun will do, a, do an admirable job. Uh, fires full charge 38 special, so the caliber is okay. Um, I think it makes a real, real practical gun for your battery. I've got an original Smith & Wesson 42, which was when this gun was first came out in the 50s. I've had mine for ever at the, my pocket gun. I carried it forever. A few years ago when Smith brought out the stainless and aluminum frame version, the, the model 642, I bought and that's what I carry now. And I'm with Bill. This is a, I tell everybody, this is a modern day Derringer. Back in the days of the old two-shot Derringer, that was a gun you used across the poker table. That was a gun you used when somebody posed an immediate threat to you, and that's what I refer to this. This is a modern Derringer. If you're carrying this and you know you're headed for trouble, you're carrying the wrong gun. But as Bill and I were talking earlier, I think there's basically three handguns. If you have a handgun self-defense battery, there's three handguns you should be looking at. Something you can carry in your pocket. To me, this Centennial Smith & Wesson's it. I've got one and it's my pocket gun. The other thing you need is what we call a mid-size compact, and that would be something like the Smith & Wesson 3913 that you could carry inside the pants holster in a summer day or in a fanny pack. 3913 or the mini Glocks. And the other category is a full-size service pistol. Or a um, uh, cold officer's model. Cold officer's, exactly. A lot of people, we don't have one here, but a lot of people like the little compact cold officer's ACP. Very popular gun. And if you're a 1911 fan, that might make a lot of sense. Pocket gun, compact gun being the officer's ACP, and then a full-size government model 1911. I typically recommend for the medium-sized gun to, to anyone that's not going to carry it in a fanny pack, I, you know, I like the, the cold officers. If you intend to carry it in a fanny pack, I personally don't particularly care, carry a cotton locked in a fanny pack just because of where the muzzle is. Where the muzzle is. You know, I, I prefer to carry a 3913 if I'm going to carry it in exactly. a fanny pack. But overall, and one other gun here, the Bills, and this is one of those little North American uh, super compact 22 revolvers. Uh, a lot of people look at it and kind of grin, but Bill understands one of the most basic rules about a gunfight, and that is have a gun. Any gun is better than no gun. And this little gun at least gives you a means of putting up a fight. When I first shot one of these, I thought, well, that's, that's a cute little toy. I mean, you know, what, what benefit that would that be? But then after I put up a target at five yards and found that I could, I could rapid fire, con consistently shoot A-zone hits with this little gun at five yards with long rifle hollow points, I thought, well, maybe that's not such a bad little deal after all because, like you say, first rule of gun fighting is to have a gun. I've always got this gun with me, no matter what. But this is a pretty good overview of some common service pistols and some concealment guns. If you don't want a 1911 or you're not comfortable with one, you may want to look at some of these. They're all very good guns and will serve you well. Remember, you still have to learn to use them efficiently and safely. Okay, we're going to discuss uh, self-defense ammunition and uh, 45 ammunition in particular. Uh, Ken and I both agree that the 45 auto, the 1911 style gun in particular, is the defensive you know, weapon of choice. And uh, 45 ammo has several advantages. Uh, and the, the hollow point version of a 45 ammo uh, has definite advantages. Uh, as my friend uh, Clint Smith always says, you know, when, when people ask him, what, what defensive ammo do you recommend? He said, well, I recommend 45 auto with a 230 grain hollow point. And when I asked him why, he said, well, with a 230 grain hollow point, if it opens up, that's great. If it doesn't, I, I just shot him with hardball, which is a, a very valid point. Um, what we've got out here in front of us is a, a sampling of 45 auto hollow point defensive ammunition. Most of it is premium defensive ammunition. And this is all loads that Ken and I have, have shot. We know it feeds well in most guns. They all have a reputation for, for good expansion and good reliability as far as uh, 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 accuracy and that sort of thing. So uh, Ken, what have we got here? Well, we've got actually samplings of each of the major big uh, ammo companies, Remington, Winchester, and Federal. And we've also got uh, examples from Hordney and also the excellent Black Hills manufactured ammo. What most all these rounds have in common is, in essence, they're 230 grain bullets. It duplicates the bullet weight of the conventional 230 grain hardball. And what we're looking for is a cartridge that first off, and most importantly, must function reliably. There's a lot of hollow point ammo on the, on the market, and over the years there's been a lot made for the 45. Some are excellent bullets, but we know they don't feed very well. 
So by today, we have a number of rounds on the market, and we're going to show you each of these briefly that have one real good uh, point about them, that they'll work very reliable uh, in almost all 45 automatics. One way that I, I uh, recommend you check to see if the ammunition is going to work well in your handgun without expending a tremendous amount of this ammunition, because a lot of the stuff, especially when you find that it's packed in a 20 or 25 round box, you know it's going to be relatively expensive per shot. One thing I always recommend is go to the range with, with your gun with a proven magazine. You'll first off break your gun in with, with less expensive ammunition, like buy Federal uh, American Eagle, Winchester White Box, or Remington UMC, one of the, the promotional type brands of hardball, or good quality hand loads. Shoot several hundred rounds through your gun. I, I think it takes a minimum of 500 rounds to fully break a gun in and make sure that it's always going to work. Go and do that first, clean the weapon properly, then go, go to the range with uh, your hollow point that you want to try, just buy one box of it first, go out to the range, fully load your magazine, lock the slide to the rear, insert the magazine with a downrange, chamber the first round. If it chambers real smooth, if it just, just strips in there with hardly any resistance, do that numerous times. You know, take the round out, top it all the way up, strip it in there. If it, if it goes in smoothly every time with no glitch, there's a real good chance that that ammunition is going to be reliable in your handgun. If you go to feed it and it hits a feed ramp and chokes and doesn't chamber, or if you feel a chunk chunk when it feeds, you can actually feel it chamber, there's a good chance that that ammunition is probably going to give problems in your gun. And if it's premium ammunition, um, like for example the Golden Sabre here that has a very good reputation for feeding well, it could potentially be your gun, not, not the ammunition. If you know your gun's right and you know it's been reliable with other, other loads, try a different type of ammo. But that's the first thing I recommend you do. Take one box out there, do the loading drill numerous times, and if it consistently chambers the round smoothly, then shoot up that box of ammo. If everything goes good and you like that particular load, go buy more of it. Put at least 200 rounds of that ammo through your gun before you load it and carry it on the street. And absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people buy themselves a handgun or whatever their choice is, and they go out and they price the stuff. And you can understand, if a manufacturer, and Bill hit the nail on the head, if a manufacturer boxes up 20 rounds of this premium ammo and sells it that way, there's a reason for it. Probably it's because it's so expensive it was in a conventional 50-round box, most people couldn't afford to buy it. We go out and pick a, a, a brand, and, and once again, there's a lot of manufacturers out there making hollow point self-defense ammo. But Bill and I both agree, you know, you can't go wrong if you go by the major names. If it says Remington or Federal or Winchester on the box, there's a real good chance that ammunition has been pretty well checked and perfected. And typically, for example, one of the rounds I've used a lot and I recommend and I find to be an extremely satisfactory round is the Federal 230 grain Hydroshock. You know, the original one had a little bit different bullet shape, actually kind of a truncated point. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, I found that round wasn't very reliable, not only 1911s. I saw Glock 21s choke with it. I saw SIG 220s that failed with it. But Federal changed it. They've got a new bullet shape that actually more or less duplicates hardball. And with this newer round, uh, I've shot thousands of rounds of this stuff and literally found it to be one of the most reliable. It's a good round. I, I like to carry it. Recently I've been trying and using the, the Remington Golden Sabre and Bill's right, it seems to be incredibly reliable. It seems to be quite accurate and in most 1911s I found this stuff to be um, an excellent feeder. Winchester, you know, recently uh, dropped their line of ammo. They had a line, product line called Black Talon and they got a little heat over their failure to do the political correct thing and the round was removed from the market. Candidly, it wasn't that good of a round to begin with, but not at all. Not at all. But they've replaced it with what they call SXT. And this round has a good reputation for feeding and reliability. Uh, I'll be honest with you, my experience, which is, remember, just my experience, this round has been the less reliable feeding of the other two. I've got a couple guns I've shot this in, quite honestly, is when you chamber the first rounds, what Bill talks what we call the kachunk, you actually feel the round hit the feed ramp, kind of over, over, uh, override the feed ramp and hit the barrel, you cut chunk. Typically, I'll find it with this round more than others, but that's why you need to check your individual weapon. Hordney offers a, a, a line of bullets and what they use their, the uh, XS, uh, XTP. XTP bullet, which has got an excellent reputation. A lot of custom reloaders and a lot of people hand load their own ammo like this bullet. Its shape and configuration is consistent with very reliable feeding. If you'll notice, the hollow cavity in it compared to the other bullets isn't quite as deep, but it's a very reliable functioning and feeding bullet. 
I've used the, the XTPs for a, a considerable amount of, of handgun hunting, you know, on deer and, and wild hogs and that sort of thing, and I've found it to be a very good bullet. Uh, every time I've recovered a bullet from game, it's looked like the, the Hornaday ad. I mean, it's been the perfect, you know, 100% weight retention mushroom. And the Black Hills ammunition is loaded with the same 230 XTP Winchester. So it's basically, there's not much difference in the, the Hornaday and the Black Hills ammunition other than price. Yeah, and I would tell everybody, and Bill was very, very correct about this, don't trust the brand of ammo just by going out and shooting one box. And also the ammo you carry in your gun, <coughs> excuse me, periodically take that ammo out and shoot it up and replace it with new ammo. One of the things we see a lot of people in the process of loading and unloading their weapon, let me just do a demonstration here and show you what we're talking about. Typically people will have a, come home at night or at the end of their day or whatever and decide they're going to unload their pistol and put it away. And let me show you what they typically do. And they end up with a problem as a result of not rotating their ammunition. I'm going to take my pistol right here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to load the pistol. I charge it. Now, I'm going to top off the magazine. Reinsert the pistol. And this is the way I'm going to carry my pistol. I come home at night. For some reason, I decide <coughs> to unload my weapon, maybe to clean it, whatever. Well, since it's expensive ammunition, I'm going to try to save it. So I take the magazine out of the pistol, <coughs> and I clear the round from the chamber. Now what happens, the next time I get re reload this pistol, I take the magazine, I load it, and I take the round that was in the chamber before and put on top and reload. And every time I unload my gun, I repeat this process. I take the magazine out and clear on the chamber. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the top two rounds and I'm, every time I'm chambering it, they're hitting the feed ramp and going in. And what can happen is eventually over a period of time, you're slowly but surely pushing that bullet deeper in the case to its original overall length is now different and it can affect the feeding reliability. So you can set yourself up so that your first or second shot may result in a, a malfunction simply because you've got a round that's badly deformed. So my advice to you is to watch that very carefully. When you look at rounds that are scratched and dinged up and you can actually take them and take a brand new round out of the box and compare the lengths. And when you see that one round that's dramatically shorter, that's a round to set aside for your practice session. That's not what you want to carry in your weapon. So be aware of that factor, because we see a lot of people who said, hey, I pulled my gun out to fire it, and the first shot malfunctioned. And I'm shooting premium ammo. What happened? A lot of times we examine that that's exactly what's happened. That round has been pushed halfway down in the case as a result of this repeated cycling in the action. Which, which brings the pressure up on some of this plus P type stuff. Could be up to dangerous levels also. That's something to also watch for when you're doing the drill. I recommend it where you go to the range strip it off the top of the magazine to see if the ammunition will feed in your gun. Same thing, don't keep using the same round over and over and over or eventually that bullet will be pushed back and you'll get a false reading on what you're trying to find out. But all these rounds are good and pick one that you feel comfortable with. Some things we've talked about earlier about muzzle flash is a consideration. You want to check that at night and you want to make sure that consistency, you can control the round. If the gun's the cartridge provides so much recoil that you're having a hard time shooting it. Remember, hits are what matter. I'd rather have a hit with a lighter charge load than a miss with a plus P exotic hollow point. And uh, of the low flash testing we did, uh, we found these two rounds to have the lowest muzzle flash of any of the ammunition that we tried. So the Winchester our, and the Remington. Yeah, the SXT Winchester and the Remington Golden Sabre 230 grain loads we found to have the lowest muzzle flash of any factory loads that we tested.
Let's just for a minute consider the requirements of what we call precision shooting at close range. One of the assumptions that everybody makes is, is if your target's real close, you really don't have to be that accurate. You can just pretty much point the gun in the general direction and as long as you hit the person somewhere in the torso, you'll have completed your task of, of neutralizing the threat. And of course, the reality is we know that's not necessarily true. In order for handgun velocity bullets to be effective, they must be placed with accuracy. Remember, handguns are not that really effective. All they are is low velocity projectiles that basically produce penetrating wounds. They just punch holes in you. And the importance is that the holes are punched in a vital place to cause rapid incapacitation. And that's typically going to be a result of a loss of blood pressure. If you look at the, the target you're shooting at, you can shoot very quickly and you may hit what we call peripheral hits. You may hit shot hits in the upper shoulders, this area, along the side, lower uh, shots in, in the abdomen. And remember, shots in here may in fact cause a lot of injury. They don't cause rapid incapacitation. So what we're talking about is shots that will be fired pretty much in the center of the chest where the heart and the major veins and arteries are to cause that rapid loss of blood pressure. Or if the case is where the, the, the assailant is shooting at you or, or facing you from around, cover and protection, all you may have is a little bit of the head pr uh, provided. And if you're going to make a cranium shot, remember, shots that strike above the eyebrows and the forehead are easily deflected in handgun velocity bullets. And yes, you may strike them, you may ex actually knock them out. We know of cases of people who have been struck in the head with handgun velocity bullets and been knocked out or temporarily dazed. But what we're talking about bullets, they strike and go into the cranium. And if you're looking at the target areas, we're really pretty small. We're talking about the eye sockets and to a large degree shots that go into the mouth. We're looking at those easy passages for the handgun velocity to penetrate. Shots to the neck can be quite vital. It's a small target, but let's be honest, it's a very effective target. So what we're talking about shooting at at close range is actually precision shots, and that requires a level of skill. And again, yes, I can point shoot quite well at close range, but if I want to make sure my shots are going to go into the eye sockets, into the mouth, into the neck, or into this upper chest area where the major uh, hydraulic zone is, where the major veins and arteries are, I've got to do that with some degree of precision. And what most of us find is you're going to have to do it with some degree of seeing the sight to get the alignment. And it's going to have to be done very quickly because if you're facing the assailant three, five yards away, you can't take the time to really be slow and line up the sight. It's got to be a very quick presentation, quick confirmation of I see my sights on the target and the magic thing of course is good trigger control. Do everything right, mash the trigger and you result in a bad shot. And remember, shots that strike cheekbones, skull, even places in the jaw are easily deflected. So let's take a little look at it. We're going to build to a demonstration particularly in this target here where we have typically a hostage taker and what we consider a no-shoot target or a target on a strike. This is kind of the worst case scenario. You find yourself uh, confronted with somebody who has taken one of your loved ones hostage and they're telling you drop your gun, give it up, give me what we want or I'm going to harm her. Classic one, the, the uh, hostile has a, a knife or a weapon threatened to him and your people can argue well the smart thing to do is, is lay your dun gun down, give it up to them, do what they say. For You don't want to do anything that might you know, harm your, your uh, loved one. Realistically remember you give up your weapon in a scenario like that you pretty much have given up your odds of doing anything you want. That's why close range, not 25 meter precision shooting, we're talking about stuff that's three to five yards. You must withdraw your weapon quickly, present it to the target, and fire a neutralizing hot shot. Just not in the head, but somewhere in the eye sockets or somewhere right into the mouth. Let's take a look and we'll let Bill run some drills here and let's see how well he performs in nice, quick, close range precision shooting. That's why you want those good high profile sights, you want a nice trigger that you control, and clearly a pistol that is capable of producing the accuracy you want and, and candidly most any good service pistol three to five yards is more than accurate enough for this assuming the pistol is zeroed to where the sights are looking. Let's let Bill run a couple of uh, strings here and demonstrate the technique we're talking about. Okay what we're going to do now folks I'm going to show you three simple drills you can practice at home for real close range encounters where you need to produce precision shots. The first one we're going to do we're going to put Bill at about five yards from his threat we're going to have his weapon out at the ready as if it would be if he was searching or clearing his home or responding to something in his house. He's got his gun out, it's in his hand. And what he's going to do is respond to the target when he feels that the time's right and give us a nice precision shot to the head. Let's watch this exercise. Ready? All right, let's try it again on my command. Ready? Up. 
Good. All right, just try another variation where the pistol's down behind your leg. You've confronted this person who poses a threat to one of your loved ones. You've got your pistol somewhat hid. You're talking to him, tell him to please leave her alone. Please get out of our house. Hey man, leave her alone. Come on, get out of our house. Get out of our house. Good. Let's do that again, Bill. Hey man, leave her alone. Come on, get out of our house. Out of our house. Excellent. Okay, the next scenario. We'll start with a weapon holstered. He's going to walk up to his almost to contact distance. This person steps out, grabs one of his, his loved ones hostage or, or takes him to custody, threatens him with a knife. He's going to do a backup exercise. He's going to gain distance, getting away from him, saying, please, leave her, let go of her, let us alone, leave us alone. As he backs up on his own, he's going to execute a nice smooth draw and fire a precision shot to the head. Let's try it, Bill. Ready? Come on, let her alone, let her alone, let her alone, let her alone. Good. Okay, let's see that one more time, Bill. Come on, let her alone. Give her, let her up, let her. Good. Excellent. And once again, you'll notice all of those shots fired into the cranium would be incredibly effective. 45 caliber rounds into that part of the face would be very effective. And believe me, when you fire a round that impacts the skull into the eye sockets, into the mouth, it once, as long as that round penetrates the, the uh, cranial cavity, that target disappears real quick. They don't stand there and look at you or hesitate. They go down real fast. If you fire that shot and they're still in front of your sights, you missed. So for a self-defense shooting, you feel that this is something people should practice at home? Yeah, that's a very good thing because remember, the reason we're not going for the chest cavity shot is because we want to incapacitate this target instantly. We know the only instantaneous stops are shots or damage to the central nervous system, the brain through the medulla or the spinal column. Shots in the body cavity may be lethal, but it may allow that person time to still take the knife and stab or the gun and pull the trigger. And once you start shooting into the body cavity this close to, to a, a, a loved one, there's always a chance because they move, you could accidentally shoot them. If you like to try at this distance, apply the precision shooting principles, and the ideal place to do it is going to be into the cranium. Wilson, Ken Hackathorn, and Lenny McGill Productions have teamed together to produce the most informative, technically correct approach to modern defensive pistol tactics and shooting techniques ever released on videotape. Twelve titles in all, packed with the latest on skills, drills, equipment, mindset, tactics, and shooting techniques, plus a whole lot more. Wilson and Hackathorn are both experts in their fields. And Lenny McGill Productions is known worldwide for its high-quality firearms-related video productions. Together, they have created a series of programs that will entertain, amaze, inform, and make you aware of the tactics you need to survive a real gunfight. Basic Self-Defense Handgun Use and Safety is a two-part set covering the basic fundamentals of shooting, grip, stance, sight picture, sight alignment, and trigger pull plus informative segments on self-defense pistols and ammunition, what happens in a real gunfight, what gun is best for you, 9mm versus 45, and lots more. Start to think about how, how can I practice and train that's going to increase my chance of survival. Advanced Self-Defense Shooting Tactics and Techniques is a five-part series that takes the viewer to a new level in both shooting skills and tactical knowledge extensive discussions and demonstrations on the use of cover, shooting while moving, both towards and away from your target, 
You'll learn the advantages of a speed reload versus a tactical reload. Aimed fire versus flash sight picture versus point shooting. Using your vehicle for cover. Shooting from a vehicle. Two shots versus one shot. Over five hours in all of the finest pistol instruction techniques in the world. One of the best lines I've, I've heard, and it's a great one, is people say, well, what's the best weapon you can have? It's your mind. Combat Ready Self-Defense Shooting Practice Drills is the first program ever that takes you into the practice routines of two of the finest pistol shooters in the world. Bill Wilson and Ken Hackathorn share 20 years of experience as they show you how to practice like a pro and increase your skill level faster and easier. You've seen both the front post. Oh yeah, on that kind of a shot, I'm getting a true sight picture. And have you seen the both front and rear sight? Oh yeah, front and rear sight, good alignment, you know, really paying attention to the front sight. Actually, just like I would be taking a 25 yard precision shot. Nightmaster, low light shooting and flashlight technique is an up-to-date look at the equipment and tactics needed to successfully utilize a handheld light source in an armed encounter. Wilson and Hackathorn demonstrate the latest flashlights, their advantages and disadvantages, and how to use them for your tactical advantage. Sometimes you can't move a big distance, but if you're here and you're illuminated and all of a sudden you see a threat, one step to the right, one step to the left, either way to get out of that zone where the incoming fire may be returned to. House Clearing and Cornering Tactics and Techniques is a 75-minute program that shows you how to enter a house or room and increase your chance for survival. Plus, you'll learn how to maintain cover, why to stay out of the fatal funnel, how to look for and avoid telegraphing target indicators, and the importance of maintaining distance from walls and cover. Plus, a very graphic demonstration of cover versus concealment as Wilson and Hackathorn shoot through ordinary walls and cinder blocks. So unlike the normal uh, indoor walls, sheetrock walls, which in reality are just concealment, concrete blocks, in fact, provide very good cover. Practical Concealed Carry is a 90-minute program that shows the basics of concealed carry, how to fit a holster to your body, over six different methods of carry, live fire drills, pocket holsters, safety, and lots, lots more. The virtue of the fanny pack is that if you're in that proverbial summer evening going out for dinner and you're just wearing a pair of shorts and a polo short or a t-shirt, the fanny pack gives you a means of carrying a little bit more substantial firearm and uh, having it readily available. Building the Ultimate 1911 Self-Defense Handgun is designed to save you time and money. The master gunsmiths of Wilson's Combat demonstrate advanced gunsmithing techniques as Bill Wilson and Ken Hackathorn discuss what are the most practical and necessary custom procedures for your 1911 handgun. Overall, this new series of 12 professionally produced videos is one of the finest resources of self-defense handgun shooting tactics and techniques in the world. Brought to you by Wilson Combat. If you would like to get involved in an exciting new shooting sport where you can use your practical carry gear, shoot realistic scenarios in a competition environment, and meet other shooters interested in defensive pistol skills, you need to check out the International Defensive Pistol Association, IDPA. They're forming clubs all over the country and in some foreign countries as well. They can be contacted at IDPA PO Box 639 in Berryville, Arkansas. The zip code is 72616-0639. Their email address is idpa.org at yournet.com or visit their website at www.idpa.com. Bill Wilson and Ken Hackathorn are two of the directors of this new exciting organization, so you know it will be practical. If you'd like to improve your defensive pistol skills, get involved today.